Very often when considering gender roles in literature, we look at women's roles and issues around women's empowerment. Um, and a lot of writers and artists tend to focus on patriarchy um, and an imbalance of power based on gender, um, either in U.S. society or in the author's home culture. And rightly so, I think these are very important issues. Uh, but Juno Diaz's work focuses on the way issues of gender and gendered stereotypes affect men. His characters often struggle with preconceived notions about what it means to, quote, be a man. And I think there are different layers and different iterations of that as well. Uh, for example, they struggle with what it means to be a Latino male, uh, what it means to be a Dominican man, what it means to be a product of a culture that seemingly values strength, lack of emotion, and little or no concern for women, unless it's your mother. Um, and I think these questions constantly plague uh, Juno Diaz's characters. For example, uh, let's take a look at the short story Drown. Uh, right in the first paragraph, um, we see that our narrator uh, characterizes his former best friend, uh, Beto, um, as a pato. P-A-T-O, pato. Um, now, this is Caribbean slang, um, and this pretty much is a slur uh, for a gay man. Um, absolutely meant to be um, an insult uh, for a gay man, right? And we see that for the narrator, uh, this concept that his best friend has, um, you know, after going to college, has come out of the closet um, as a gay man. And of course, the fact that he has had a sexual encounter, two sexual encounters with this young man, are constantly plaguing him, constantly on his mind. Um, and I'd say after these two uh, encounters, uh, the narrator has an internal conflict uh, because he doesn't know how to reconcile his image, his preconceived notion of masculinity, with the fact that he's had these sexual encounters with Beto. Uh, so he seems to feel uh, sort of disgusted with himself. Um, and at one point he says he thinks he's going to turn out abnormal and become a pato himself. Um, it's a little bit similar to saying he thinks he's going to become a faggot, uh, which would be, I think, the translation for that uh, particular term. Um, and later in the story, we have a moment uh, when he goes out with uh, two of his friends, uh, Alex and Danny, um, and he has this encounter outside uh, a gay bar. So I'm going to read from the text here. I'm quoting. Uh, At the Old Bridge Turnpike, we pass the fag bar, which never seems to close. Patos are all over the parking lot, drinking and talking. Sometimes Alex will stop by the side of the road and say, Excuse me. When somebody comes over from the bar, he'll point his plastic pistol at them, just to see if they'll run or shit their pants. Tonight, he just puts his head out the window. Fuck you, he shouts, and then settles back in his seat, laughing. That's original, I say. He puts his head out the window again. Eat me, then. Yeah, Danny mumbles from the back. Eat me. And I think this scene right here shows just how necessary it is uh, for the narrator to keep his interactions, those, those sexual encounters with Beto, a secret. I mean, these characters are literally screaming, eat me, um, at these gay men, and it's got to be on the narrator's mind um, that that term refers to oral sex and that Beto has uh, performed oral sex on the narrator. Um, and I think this really questions his own uh, understanding about what it means to be a man and his concept of masculinity. And adding to this uh, conflict that he has uh, is his impression of his father. So this narrator sees his father as a failure of a man, right? This is not what a man is supposed to be. And this is someone who has cheated on his wife, left his wife, um, and he sort of plays games, he sort of manipulates her. Uh, emotionally by telling her to come visit him in Florida uh, but we see that he does not really want to resume his life with her um, and he does not really want to be present uh, in the narrator's life and the narrator feels like it's his responsibility to protect his mother and again I really think this fits into uh, this sort of concept of masculinity even machismo um, that he 
strongly feels like he has to fill this void that his father left um, and be a source of protection uh, for his mother. And we see this when he provides her money. Uh, he gives her $50 and imagines how she's going to spend it. But he also remembers his father uh, giving her $100. And I think that's sort of symbolic um, of him trying to fill this role. But he hasn't quite grown into it. Right? Um, now the narrator... Um, now, the narrator of the sun, the moon, and the stars um, really seems to have a similar uh, issue going on in terms of uh, issues around masculinity. All right? So I'm just going to read from the very first paragraph, opening lines of the story. I'm not a bad guy. I know how that sounds, defensive, unscrupulous, but it's true. I'm like everybody else, weak, full of mistakes, but basically good. Magdalena disagrees, though. She considers me a typical Dominican man, a sucio, an asshole. Uh, now, that word sucio means filthy or dirty, a dirty guy. Um, but really, I think right from the start here, we set up this dichotomy. Uh, there are two different ways of being a man. He can be a good guy, in his own words. I'm not a bad guy. I'm basically good. Or he could be a typical Dominican man. Um, and that really sets up this concept that being a typical Dominican man does not mean being a good guy. It does mean being a filthy guy. It does mean being an asshole. And to some degree, it's hard to see it here because he's struggling real hard against some uh, deeply ingrained um, values, I would say. Um, but I do think uh, our narrator, Junior, is struggling to become a good guy. Okay, now that's not reflected in the way he treats Magdalena. Um, I don't think his behavior toward her is reflective of what it is to be a good guy. Um, but he seems to want to do the right thing, and he seems to want to convince himself that he is, that he is uh, a good guy overall. <clears throat> Of course, Magda is described as a forgiving soul. Uh, she has a strong relationship with her parents. Um, she has strong uh, spiritual and religious beliefs. Uh, so I'd say she fits the norm to some degree about what a good girl, in quotation marks, is supposed to be. Right? So now it's up to Junior to fit the role of a good guy. Right? Um, and I'm looking at this quote. Uh, there's a moment when, uh, after she has found out uh, that he's been cheating on her, um, and she asks him, why don't you leave me alone? And Junior, the narrator, says, I told her the truth. It's because I love you, mommy. Um, and he goes on to say, I know that sounds like a load of doo-doo, but it's true. Magda's my heart. I didn't want her to leave me. I wasn't about to start looking for a girlfriend because I'd fucked up one lousy time. And I think this tells us a lot about our narrator. One is that he is willing to tell the reader directly, uh, Magda is my heart. He truly cares for her. He truly wants to do what's right for her. Uh, but he's absolutely unable to, right? He cheats. Um, he sort of justifies it. He says, uh, you know, I messed up one time um, as if it were insignificant somehow. Um, so, no, I don't think he's doing what is right for her. Uh, and I think he's struggling and failing uh, to figure out what it is to be a good guy. Right? Um, and absolutely, I mean, I think one of the strongest images uh, in this story is this moment when uh, Junior is in bed with Cassandra um, and she is naked and she's uh, rubbing her body against him and he's on the phone with Magda, right? She says, you sound funny. And he says, well, uh, I just miss you, right? And I think we really see clearly um, as readers that he's not doing what is best for her based on... Um, a lot of these voices that he's hearing. Uh, another significant part of this story to me is uh, the friends, right? What Junior refers to as my boys, 
um, and what he refers to as Cassandra's girlfriends, um, and the advice that they give them, right? So each one of these characters is coming into this relationship with all of these words of advice and all of these impressions uh, from their friends. And yes, it's significant that Junior's friends are males and that Magda's friends are all females, right? And they're telling Magda, uh, you know, forget him. He screwed up once, you know, don't give him another chance. I think he calls them the sorest losers on the planet. But it's also significant to look at the messages that he's hearing from his friends. Uh, so two lines that stick out to me uh, that his friends tell him are, fuck that bitch, and later in the story, nigger, sounds like you're wasting a whole lot of loot on some bullshit. Referring to his plan to take Magda to the Dominican Republic and try and patch things up. Those are both quotes from the text. Um, and when he's on this trip uh, in the Dominican Republic, I think we see just how vulnerable he truly is. You know, in his mind, uh, this trip is a way to, to fix the relationship. Um, it's a way to share uh, part of his culture and his heritage that he values uh, with Magda. And clearly none of those things happen. In fact, her vision about what this trip is about is very different from his. We see this when she wants to go to the resorts, she wants to go to the beaches, uh, and she doesn't really want to spend time in these neighborhoods where uh, Junior's uh, grandfather lived and he feels these connections. Uh, but I think in part that's symbolic of the way that they both have different uh, perspectives and they're moving towards a very different path. Okay. Uh, we also see on this trip uh, just how insecure uh, Junior is. Uh, for example, uh, every time uh, a male talks to Magda, uh, he gets jealous. And we really do get the impression that she could have uh, something better, a better relationship than what she has with Junior. For example, uh, she talks to a Dominican-American lawyer. Um, and he's a lawyer, he's from the New York area, and you sort of think, well, maybe that would be a better option for her, right? Um, not that she's uh, going to cheat on him, I don't think that's in her character, um, but I think he sees uh, that she does have options and that, you know, her world can be a lot bigger uh, than just him. And it seems inevitable to us as readers that the relationship's going to unravel um, on this trip, it seems clear to everyone except Junior, um, until he has this uh, pseudo-spiritual uh, vision in the supposed mythical cave uh, that was the birthplace of the Tainos, uh, the indigenous uh, Caribbeans. Um, and I think this is the first time that we see that Junior actually is capable of being a good guy, but it requires him to let go of Magda and let go of his relationship with her. It isn't until their relationship is over and that she has moved on that we feel like she has actually uh, benefited or, and that he has actually done something for her, which of course was ending the relationship. That was the best thing he could have done for her. Um, and as for this concept that Junior, um, in his cheating um, and the way he I think tries to manipulate her um, and the way he talks about her with his friends and they talk about her uh, this concept that he is a quote typical Dominican man uh, notice at the end Magda is dating another Dominican man and she uses the words nice guy to describe him uh, and she says that he loves her and that is meant to be a stark contrast to Junior. And I think it's also a way of showing us that this concept of um, disrespect towards women does not have to be culturally ingrained because this is a Dominican man who treats Magda well. <clears throat> One last note on Diaz's characters. Uh, the collection of short stories titled Drown um, that the short story Drown comes from, was published in 1996. Uh, roughly 10 years later, uh, Diaz went, in, went on to write 
uh, a novel called The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. Recommended reading right there. Um, and these feature the same narrator. Several stories in the, sh in the short story collection Drown uh, explicitly state that the narrator is a character named Junior. Um, using the Caribbean pronunciation there. Um, and then in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, uh, we recognize that this is the same character, this is Junior again, um, and then later in a collection of stories called This Is How You Lose Her, uh, we have this short story, The Sun, the Moon, and the Stars. So one way of reading these two stories, Drown and The Sun, the Moon, and the Stars, next to each other, is to say that this is the same narrator, and that the narrator from Drown uh, was younger, I don't know, maybe 17 or so, uh, and that he, has went, that he went on uh, to become the junior that we see in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and that the issues around masculinity that we see with his sexual encounters with Beto, uh, with his distaste for his father, and his desire to protect his mother, play out throughout his life in his relationships with women.